to the SJ Child Show, hosted by SJ Childs, streaming on all podcast platforms and on YouTube. Find us on all social medias. The SJ Child Show, bringing value to families through education and resources. Check us out weekly, where we'll have new and exciting guests. Thanks so much for your support. Enjoy the show. This episode is brought to you by S.J. Childs Books for Children. Visit sjchilds.org today to check out their special needs book collection. Teach inclusion and your diversity in this special seven book collection. Get yours today. Sponsors include Blinky Minky Blankets, handmade double-sided minky blankets, highest quality and craftsmanship, creating your perfect blanket for your loved one as a special forever gift. Code word the mouth for discount today. By Dan and Ball Legal Services. Avoid common legal mistakes and protect your small business. Dana makes it affordable for your Utah small business to avoid common legal mistakes with business operations, contracts, and employees. Get more information today at danaballlaw.com. By Moving with Autism, a service for autism families seeking real estate and design services that provide support for their child's development and family lifestyle. Natalie Castro is a Utah Autism Real Estate Specialist and Autism Sibling whose mission is to connect families to community support with sensory-friendly designs and relocation services. By Elevation Chiropractic Center. Get started on your path to full health. Elevation Chiropractic Center uses the upper cervical chiropractic technique to get results by identifying and solving the root issues of your medical condition quickly and safely. Elevation Chiropractic Center, Salt Lake City, Utah. This story is brought to you by Water and Body Basics, West Valley City, Utah. Hi, and welcome to the SJ Child Show. I'm your host, SJ Childs, and today I have a very special, exciting guest. I'm sure we won't laugh at all, uh, except for when we do. And please meet John Borges. Did I sound say that correctly? Uh, you're in the you ballpark. It correctly it's, for it's, me? <laughs> it's Vorhaus. That rhymes with, well, never mind. It's easy to remember. <laughs> well, and you know, I'm really good at phonetics. So oh. that that's my problem in pronouncing, you know, pronunciation is that I always have to think it's phonetically spelled. I, I used <laughs> I used to think that I was burdened with a joke name and that therefore all of the torments of my youth and all of the, the fractures in my personality could be um, attributed to getting bullied over my name. Oh. But I've come to realize it doesn't matter what your name is. They're going to bully you about something. Oh, isn't that Even if true? your name is Joe Smith, they'll call you average joe or something like that. <laughs> yeah oh they, they know they'll come up with it away thing. yeah that's certainly true so true you have had a very exciting career in life um comedian writer actor tell us a little bit about that and you know what got this all started for you well uh, the two controlling ideas of my life are uh a, a magpie's affection for new things. <laughs> I'm drawn to new things like magpies are drawn to shiny objects yeah. and, a, and a, an aversion, like an almost blood aversion to being an employee of anyone. Oh yeah, there I you just, go. just could never feel comfortable in that space. You and I are so much alike. <laughs> <laughs> We're siblings from another I parent. I think so. <laughs> to to degenderize that phrase. Um, so I, from about the age of 25, at about the age of 25, I quit my last so-called normal job. I was an advertising copywriter, and I realized I'd come to a, a crossroads pretty early in my life because uh, they were offering me some fame and you know money and, and validation to do what I was doing. But I, I had this terrible fear that I might wake up at the age of 40 and realize I'd spent the best years of my life making the world safe for advertising. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that just wasn't going to happen. And and um, also, I had the idea that I didn't want to wait until I retired to enjoy my life. Yeah. I wanted to kind of weave that into the possibilities early on. So I quit my job and made the I'm going to say the fantastically unstrategic choice of becoming a singer songwriter. 
Now, my thoughts were that as a singer songwriter, I could find the shortest distance between myself and my audience. I had these thoughts that I wanted to share. I could compose them as songs and sing them and play them on guitar and, and reach my audience that way. I neglected to uh, consider two important things that I couldn't do particularly well, and that is sing and play guitar. <laughs> so I, I spent about five years on the folk circuit in New England, but mostly kind of skilling up my entrepreneurial chops, getting really used to beating my head against the phone, mm -hmm. creating opportunities for myself, leaning into opportunities that presented themselves, and really just getting good at being adaptive and versatile. Yeah. So by the time I moved to Hollywood in 85, 1985, I moved into situation comedy and I had some good success there, primarily because I could write for a bunch of different kinds of shows. I was pitching and working on shows as different from one another as Married with Children and Wonder Years. Yeah. And, and then I branched out into our drama and I dabbled in horror and um, thriller. And I came to understand that I was using the same creative problem solving tools in different ways to meet the writing needs that I faced. Also came to understand that Hollywood as an industry is one that is very uh, adept at extending and withholding validation. Mm -hmm. And so I went through a, a kind of a rocky period where I, I felt really good about myself because Hollywood was giving me so much validation. And then when the newness of me wore off and I stopped getting that validation, I entered a crisis period yeah. since I no longer had external validation to prop me up, what's going to prop me up? And that's when I made the fundamental life understanding that validation has to come from within, approval, acceptance has to come from within, because that's the only currency that has any value in the emotional space between our ears. I love that. That realization gave me a lot more bandwidth to pursue projects that were meaningful to me and to chase economic opportunities mm -hmm. that came about. I wrote this book called The Comic Toolbox, How to Be Funny Even If You're Not. Most <laughs> people who know me know me from that work. It's the first book of some two dozen that I've written. And in some ways, it continues to be the difference maker in my career. No, in many yeah. ways. Because thanks to that book and the advent of the internet, which came about at the same time, suddenly I was getting inquiries from people I'd never heard of in countries I'd never been to saying, hey, we really like this work. Is there any chance you would come and teach us what you know. And I'm like, well, let me see what the deal is here. I get to travel around the world exchanging information for experience and money. Sign me up. Heck yes. And 37 countries later, I've made oh. quite a career out of that and also fulfilled that earlier thing about not waiting to retire yes. to enjoy the life or oh, be the life that I wanted to live. Yes. Um, if you ask me what holds all of this together, what's the glue? No, that's not the right word. What's the fuel? that drives this engine. I can boil it down to four words and they're not just useful to me. I think they're useful to everyone. The four words are don't fear bad outcomes. Mm. A lot of what holds us back is just the sense if I try this thing, it's not gonna work out and it's yeah. gonna fail so spectacularly that I will die. <laughs> Obviously that's not a realistic uh, <laughs> uh, approach. Uh, outcome. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it, it's not credible, you're not gonna die. <laughs> Your failure is not going to fail you. Yeah. It's going to inform you. Mm. And in my case, it's just left me wide open to embrace every new experience, whether I think I can pull it off or not. Yeah. And I could give you countless examples from my life where my strategy has been, if there's something I want to learn how to do, I find someone to pay me to teach it with no <laughs> fear no fear of failing to teach it, yeah. but rather with the certainty that as an avid learner, I'm going to bring something to the teaching experience that someone who is a, a, a seasoned practitioner in that field will never bring. And the only thing that keeps me from doing that is the fear of failure of which I have none. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I love that too, because you really have to step in. You have to lean into those fears. You have to lean into those to get the opportunities. That's how opportunities come to you is by you opening yourself up to receiving all of those wonderful things with the belief in yourself that you can accomplish and retire early and go and enjoy your life. And, you know, for some of us enjoy success with, you know, family or however, being an author, I just, I think that that's so wonderful. Can I tell you there's a trap in the notion of retiring early? Because if you follow the path, if one follows the path that you just described, self-actualization, choosing your projects according to where your passion and your purpose lie, doing stuff you love to do, it kind of 
uh, negates or renders irrelevant the idea of, of retiring. Really retiring. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. My, as, as I enter the, the final decades of my life, uh, my motto is finish hard. Oh, I like uh, that. Isn't that I great? love that. Yeah, Friend? I think so. That's how I try to go every day, you know? Yeah. Friends say I have a gift for reducing complex concepts to trivial one-liners. And I think <laughs> that, that's, that's a good example of it. Definitely. Oh my goodness. What kind of, um, in, what kind of inspired you? Where did you get your inspiration? Anybody exciting, special, a book or anything, movie? Ah, well, that's a really good question. I, I binge read authors in my youth and I was really impressed with the idea that the same voice could produce so much different story content that was uh, that was still in the same frame. You know, if I enjoyed an author, I enjoyed his in, or her entire body of work. Um, when I when I spent ten years writing poker books, hello, where did that come from? <laughs> um, I I was um, I was an avid poker player and as a recreationalist, but I was also writing about poker in poker magazines before poker got hot. Mm. And then when poker did get hot, uh, I went to my agent and I said, I think I can sell a book in this market. And he said, I can't sell one, but I know I can sell three. And I, I, <laughs> I didn't it work. Well, it, he said, he said, if, if you can create a series, that's what will sell in this market. Ooh. So I created the Killer Poker series. But in discussions with him, I said, I don't really think I have got three books worth of stuff to say about <laughs> poker. And he said, sure you do. If you have the contract, you'll find the content. And he <laughs> was not wrong. Yeah. So that, that caused me to reflect upon the work of authors who I admired, not just for the quality of their writing, but for the depth and breadth of their career. And I mm -hmm. thought, if they can find new things to say, then maybe I can too. And like I said, I ended up writing 10 books on poker alone. Wow. So, and so they range from the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> I, well, I wrote a book, I, I, I co-authored a book with poker great Annie Duke called Decide oh, yeah. to Play. I, the book is called Decide to Play Great Poker. And it is legitimately one of the top poker books to that. date. But then I turned around and I wrote a spoof of my own book called Decide to Play Drunk Poker, <laughs> which, which is not on anybody's top 10 list or even top 10,000 list. But it was really gratifying to me yeah. to, uh, to, to examine both sides of that question from the serious strategic to the uh, comic non-strategic. Yeah, definitely. Well, even in, in the series that you said, you know, you had written for previously from the diversity between the two, the, you know, really comedic, like married with children, you know, that kind of style all the, and the wonder years. I mean, they're so separate from one another, same, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's, that shows right there, that same inspiration that you drew from that. And, and it also goes back to the, to the question, we can set versatility as a goal. Yeah. You could say, as a writer, I wish to train myself to be versatile or a singer or any other creative practice. But the, the block, the specific process block that stands in the way is the sense that this is my lane and I have to stay in my lane. And so if you're like me, you kind of claim all lanes <laughs> as your lane, yeah. whether you belong in them or not. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and that, that gives you a, a real opportunity to seize new chances or new opportunities for growth that come along, but only if you can be fearless enough, or again, not fearing bad outcomes enough to, to put yourself up for it. Take some risks. I can't, I can't tell you how many times in my life I have sent out emails to people just randomly saying, I think you should hire me to do X or Y. And how much of my thinking at that moment is, of course, they're going to say yes, just because I'm me and I bring so much to this. and I'm so right for it. And I've been right a bunch of times and I've been wrong a bunch of times, but that that gobsmacked optimism has never left me. And even mm -hmm. now today, I, I I'll come across something that looks like, hey, that might be cool for me. Let me go for that. I, just last week, I was... Uh, uh, I've, I put myself forward to be a color commentator on a professional ultimate Frisbee video <laughs> feed. That. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've been playing ultimate all my life, so I know a thing or two about it. And I've been in broadcast booths with poker and for other reasons, yeah. but I'd never really done this before. And I, somebody asked, will you do it? And I said, 
heck yes. Why would I not do it? Mm-hmm. So that's, I love that. I love the opportunities that all, this is all brought about, you know, and uh, just in, do, in those types of things, you take the opportunities that that arise by taking risks and getting new opportunities that come about. So that's wonderful. And it kind of, yeah, answered the I, question, like what, uh, go, go ahead, what you're going to say. I was just going to say uh, the the word risk is associated with so much fear. Mm. I fear to take a risk. It's almost automatic that your relationship with risk should be a fear relationship. And that certainly is true if you're talking about, you know, free climbing El Capitan, <laughs> you have, you, it's legitimate to be afraid of that. But, but when it comes down to things like, hey, should I go out to my first live open mic? Or should I try to get a, a, a job doing corporate stand up? Or should I send a song into a, a, an artist who I might want to record that song? Those risks, they're, they're not physical risks. They're emotional risks, and they specifically risk our sense of uh, emotional well-being. And once we separate physical risk from emotional risk, then we can say of emotional risk. The worst that can happen is they say no, and I don't get a positive outcome. But if I don't ask, I'm still going to get a not positive outcome because I'm not going to get any outcome at all. Viewed through that filter, you have everything to gain and nothing to lose by just throwing out the window and see if it lands. Absolutely. Invest in yourself because there's nothing that can go wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Like you said, if anything, you'll learn a lesson to try something a different way the next time or Mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. What moving forward, what are your plans and what are you going to be doing next? Oh boy, that's a great question. <laughs> right? Give me your five uh, year. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I, I, can, I can give you a five year plan. Right now, I have practices, creative practices in f- visual art, in nonfiction writing, and stand up comedy. And we'll talk about the visual art in a second, but the nonfiction writing and the stand up comedy are coming together in my new book called The Little Book of Stand Up. Okay. Which will be out toward the end of the year. And the will be a companion to my book, The Little Book of Sitcom, which they're both designed to give you a lot of information and a lot of inspiration without requiring that you read too many words. (laughs) (laughs) But my experience is in this world we live in, people's Uh. attention spans are getting smaller and smaller. So I wanna make sure that I deliver um, a a content package that is useful, but not overwhelming. Mm. Left to my own devices, I'm gonna make everything 500,000 words. (laughs) That's not gonna work out because I love to write. while I'm advancing on that front, I'm also advancing my active practice of art. I started, I really ramped it up during the pandemic. I started it a few years ago, but I really ramped it up in the pandemic. And the the watershed moment for me was during the pandemic, I did what I called the 100 Head Project, which was 100 self-portraits in 100 days, oh. posted on Facebook as a fundraiser for Doctors Without Borders. And the challenge, meeting the challenge of rethinking my art, reinventing, making art every day, really uh, upped my game to the Mm -hmm. point where I passed out of, I want to be an artist and into, I think I kind of am an artist. And if you're watching on video, you can see all of the images in the background. That's my stuff. Beautiful. I was going to ask if that's what that was. Wonderful. Thank you. So today, now today I have my first uh, installation at a local cafe. I'm out there in the world with my art for the first time. At one of my favorite places to be, too, the cafe. Yes, there you go. Um, if I'm to to be honest with myself, as I try to be, I, I, reckon, I, I reckon that I am this as an attraction for whatever my thoughts, my comedy, my art, anything at all. I can fill a room. I can fill a classroom, but I can't fill an auditorium. I'm kind of a rarefied taste. I'm kind of an acquired taste. (laughs) I'm pretty smart. And I kind of require that people who work with me be operate at my level. Mm -hmm. So so what this means is that that I have an unfulfilled aspiration to be huge in the world. And I'm going to be 66 years old next month. And I kind of recognize that aspiration is probably not going to be resolved (laughs) in this lifetime. But I also have a long history of making meaningful impact Mm -hmm. in more people's lives than I can count. So part of what I need to do in the years to come is to continue to advance my creative practices along the lines of my strength 
which means figuring out how I can reach the people I want to reach as meaningfully as possible and not worrying so much about the big picture. Yeah. This is also useful for people who are in my situation. They're what we call creative entrepreneurs with the full understanding that, man, it's a crowded space out there. Mm. You know, how is my art going to be seen? How are my words going to be read? And especially, how am I going to make money on this mm. when there are so many other people out there who are delivering the same kind of content and they're happy to do it for free just for recognition, just for validation, yeah. which I completely honor. I've been there myself. Mm -hmm. I am there myself. Um, the way I like to think of it is this. The world we live in, and especially the internet, where our, our work is being seen more and more, it's like a giant, um, it's a realm. And my little tiny part of it is an amusement park. It's a tiny amusement park in this vast, unknowable space. And all I can do is keep improving and expanding my little amusement park and inviting people to come visit. Yeah. It's not going to rival Disneyland. <laughs> it's not intended to rival Disneyland. In order for it to rival Disneyland, I have to be corporately engaged with someone like Disney. That ain't going to happen. <laughs> All of which comes down to recognizing and honoring what I'm good at mm -hmm. and also recognizing and honoring my limitations mm -hmm. without driving myself too crazy about roads not taken and what if scenario. Yes, definitely. So what would you say then is your definition of success that you've had? The simplest definition that I go to in knee-jerk response, success is enjoying your days. Yeah. And that's a little disingenuous because there's so much that goes into success that involves, uh, you know, creating the kinds of life, the kind of life where you can enjoy your days, getting out from under a full-time job, just having enough money, time, and resources to do what you want to do. Let me see if I can give you a better answer. For creative people or um, searchers, seekers, mm -hmm. we can say that there's something called our practice. Mm -hmm. Okay, You can have a practice of art or practice of music or practice of comedy or practice of spiritual exploration, practice of anything. When people engage in a practice, they're often thinking about what will this lead to? How will it pay off? But my experience of practice is if I invest in my practice, if I do my creative work, it creates greater capability for me to stay in my practice and greater motivation for me to stay in my practice, which is all I want to do anyhow, yes. in my practice as much as possible. So for me, success is recognizing that I am in my practice and taking conscious self-aware steps to advance and expand my practice so that I can be in my practice more and more as time goes by. Yeah, I absolutely agree and love that because I um, the same way. I love podcasting. I love to listen and connect with people and hear their stories and uh, just learn from the wisdom of the experiences that they have had. And there's so much to take away, so much value. Where can people find your books and uh, your programs, things like that? Send us on the, on a chase. I, 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 before I answer that question, I have to frame it in a couple of different ways. <laughs> One is um, I recently did a podcast with some people in Great Britain. And after I gave my pitch, they said, that's what's different about you, Yanks. You're not afraid to tell people what you're doing and what you have for sale. We don't do that in Great Britain. Oh, we're, like, yeah. we're always like, well, uh, probably people won't want to go to my website, but if they did, they could find it here. The other <sighs> thing is every time one is asked to self-promote. As a creative person, there's a lot of tension, a lot of nervousness in that space because there's always this little voice inside our head that says, you're asking for people to spend real money on your stuff. Do you <laughs> actually think it's worth anything? You know, oh. this is the demon voice inside yeah. our head. Um, to surface this issue, when I do um, in-person presentations, when I'm in classes or um, master classes or big seminars, uh, I always come to the end of my presentation with, with this. I say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to throw the, the, the floor open to questions. But as I do, as is my practice, I reserve the right to take the first question psychically. <laughs> and then I go, uh-huh. 
Uh-huh. Yes, that is a very good question. I do have books for sale. Let me tell you all about them. <laughs> I you, love you, that. You can see that the joke explodes the tension yeah. that, that is informed by the insecurity about promoting one's works. But the fact is, if you're going to be an artist of any kind, and I'm using yeah. artist in the broadest definition, you're going to have to create and you're also going to have to promote. Otherwise, your stuff is just never going to be seen. Absolutely. With all of that said... <laughs> Let me introduce your listeners and viewers to the marvelous world that is John Vorhaus. Ladies and gentlemen, if you know my name, J-O-H-N-V-O-R-H-A-U-S, then you pretty much have the keys to the kingdom because my website is johnvorhaus.com and there you will find a number of books that you can buy in print form or for very easy digital download, not very expensive. Some of them are hardcore useful, like the little book of sitcom. Some are more obliquely useful, like my book, A Million Random Words, not available in print form, only digital form, because <laughs> it runs to 5,000 pages. But it's a real handy resource for all kinds of creative, <laughs> um, creative endeavors. And I, I I created it as a joke, but it sold a few copies because people do see that they can find character names, story ideas, found <laughs> objects, hidden poetry, all kinds of crazy yeah. stuff in there. So johnvorehouse.com, that gives you a certain set of my books and also a peek at my art. Then with John Vorehouse, you can type my name into your Amazon search field and find your way to my Amazon author page which has a bunch of other books, some the same, mostly different because on my Amazon author page, there are a lot of books that other publishers hold the rights to as mm -hmm. opposed to the ones that I hold the rights to. But my entire body of work is there, including especially the comic toolbox and creativity rules and my great con artist novels, the California Roll, the Albuquerque Turkey and the Texas Twist. I love that. Well, that's a bunch of other books. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. And well, you know, well, well, I have somebody that wants one of those 5,000 words, but I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. Okay. <laughs> uh, but wait, there's more. Because as you know, I'm also an artist and I've put a lot of my uh, images and graphics into a Redbubble store. Um, people listening won't see this, but here is an example of a beautiful coffee mug, Ooh. which I took one of my original works of art called Light as a Feather. And I know you're interested in disability yeah. mobility issues. So I thought yes, you would be particularly. I love that, actually. That's, that's great. Thank you. And it's available yeah. on mugs, T-shirts, towels, uh, bathroom, bath mats, anything you can think of. <laughs> love it. And finally, if you know my name, you know my email address because it's john.vorehouse at gmail.com. And I always welcome direct interaction with the world out there so it's kind. how i build my business how i build my practice and how i satisfy my soul so oh, what a pleasure to have you here today it's been so fun it's been a wonderful conversation um yeah i absolutely thank you for your time and space to be here so yeah very gracious <laughs> it's it's my pleasure it's my pleasure have a great day you um, too think oh. positive test negative hey i like that <laughs> I Good have that on a mug. On. <laughs> I, I have that on a mug as well. I love it. Thank you so much for being here, John. We'll talk to you soon. My pleasure. Bye bye. Handmade double sided minky blankets. Highest quality and craftsmanship, creating your perfect blanket for your loved one as a special forever gift. Code word the mouth for discount today. By Dan and Ball Legal Services. Avoid common legal mistakes and protect your small business. Dana makes it affordable for your Utah small business to avoid common legal mistakes with business operations, contracts, and employees. Get more information today at danaballlaw.com. By Moving with Autism, a service for autism families seeking real estate and design services that provide support for their child's development and family lifestyle. Natalie Castro is a Utah autism real estate specialist and autism sibling whose mission is to connect families to
community support with sensory friendly designs and relocation services by Elevation Chiropractic Center. Get started on your path to full health. Elevation Chiropractic Center uses the upper cervical chiropractic technique to get results by identifying and solving the root issues of your medical condition quickly and safely. Elevation Chiropractic Center, Salt Lake City, Utah. This story is brought to you by Water and Body Basics, West Valley City, Utah.